Uh, just a quick note I forgot to mention earlier. We did have a missions, or not a mission, we had a membership meeting uh, this last Tuesday evening. There was about seven, I think, or eight in attendance. And uh, if those that were there are interested in pursuing membership, uh, please come and talk to me after the service. We'll make some arrangements to get together and uh, work that through. If, by some chance, you would like, to, would like to have been at that meeting but were unable to come, let me know as well because we can make other arrangements so we can go through that material on what membership means or what it means to be a part of a local church like Noble Park Baptist Church. Leave that there. If you have a Bible with you, and I sure hope you do, please open it to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42, which Ben read to us just a few moments ago. Just to recap a little bit from last week's message as we continue on, we're considering the Lord's servant because we want to see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. And the reason why we want to see him and behold him in his glory is because beholding him results in our being transformed into Christ's image. And that also glorifies him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So our goal for this series, and indeed our goal for all of ministry, is to hold up for everybody to see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for us all, every one of us, to be changed and transformed into Christ's image. And we saw last week from verse 1, we beheld the Lord's servant whom the Lord upholds whom the Lord chose, and whom the Lord delights in. Now, I want to clarify a point that we made last week, and it's a very important point. And I was a bit concerned after the service that in my stumbling of my words a little bit, I might have not presented it very clearly. And that point has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we were discussing the point of the servant being chosen. And what we want to get across is this, that the, the human nature of Jesus is chosen from before creation. You say, how can that be? So to clarify, and I want to be as precise as possible about this, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, eternally exists from eternity past to eternity future. But the man Jesus in his human nature, was conceived in Mary's womb at a specific point in time. Now, what I don't want you to walk away thinking is that the Son of God began when Jesus was conceived. That's not what I'm saying. The Son of God eternally exists, but Jesus in his human nature was conceived at a point in time. He grew in the womb. He was born and so on. At the very moment of that conception, human nature and divine nature were joined and fastened together so that there's no blending or mingling. There's not two natures that kind of dissolve into one. That's not what happens. Jesus is not half God and half man. That's not what happens either. Jesus is human nature and divine nature joined together into one person. So the two natures never mingle, but now, having begun like that, sorry, having been born like that, no, that's wrong again, having been joined at that conception, the two natures are never taken apart again, ever. So our Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven, in human nature and divine nature joined together. He has a physical human body just like ours. And one of the wonders about going to heaven is we will recognize our Lord Jesus Christ, not only because of his glory as God, whom he truly is, we'll also recognize the glory of God, whom he truly is, and the scars in his hands and his feet and his side and his his scalp, and so on, from the, the thorns that Wes was mentioning earlier. 
But it's very important that we don't get that wrong because getting it wrong puts us into heresy, and that's a very bad place to be. So I wanted to make sure I clarified that really important point. Now then, coming to today's message. All servants serve in some form or another. Every servant will have one key, one primary aspect of service. And Jesus Christ, who is the Lord's servant, who's been spoken of here in Isaiah 42, has such a ministry. He ministers the word to all people. But how? What is the power of his ministry? And we as Christians little Christ, what that means, we who are being transformed into his image, how is it that we minister? What is the power, if you like, for our ministry? What did his ministry look like? Um, what should, what must our ministry look like? And again, as, as last week, we want to see Christ. We want to see him and be transformed by what we see to see how he lived his life and to know from his example how we are to live our lives today. We want to be like miniature living statues of Christ, representing and portraying Christ to all those around us. And Paul makes a point, like I made last beginning last week, over and over again through his ministry, that they proclaim Christ with the goal in mind that we would be changed into Christ's image. I mentioned last week, what about all the issues? What about all the concerns? What about all the problems that should be addressed from the pulpit? And my conviction is that as we, port as we present and see Christ, and as we see him and are being changed into Christ's image, we will learn how to see and understand and respond to those things. So I could sit down and make up a list of, say, a hundred different issues that are going on in society and address them from the pulpit, from Scripture, one after another, after another, after another. And on a day 101, someone will rock up and say, yeah, but what about this one? You haven't addressed that one yet. Or what about this issue? You haven't addressed that one yet. And I can just keep going on. And all I'm doing is giving you responses to every single issue out there. But if, I, if we, all of us, because we're all being transformed into Christ's image, it's not just you, it's all of us together. If we are changed into Christ's image and learn to think through the lens of Scripture, the filter of Scripture, learn to think as Christ thought, then we'll understand not just a hundred issues out there, but every single one, thousands of them. Because we'll learn to think with the mind of Christ as we are being transformed into Christ's image. Having said all that, I want us to see this morning the, the ministry of the Lord's servant. And first of all, the power for ministry is from the Holy Spirit. And you can see that right there in front of you. In verse number one, he says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. The first idea that I want you to notice there is the idea of upon or resting is not limited to just resting on top of. There is a purpose for which the spirit rests on Christ, and that is to fill him all the way through. Now, the question would probably be asked, why would the Son of God need the filling of the Holy Spirit for ministry? Christ in his divine nature, obviously requires no filling of the Spirit for ministry. Because, as we know from a study of the Trinity, that the Spirit is eternally proceeding from the Father and Son. The Spirit is equally God as the Son is God. So why would the Son need to be filled with the Spirit? And the same answer comes back again. Jesus, in his human nature needed and was blessed with the filling of the Holy Spirit for ministry as the Lord's servant. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that God anointed, and that's the idea of filled, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for, for 
God was with him. Now the phrase, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, speaks very clearly. Why didn't Peter, who I believe is speaking here, why didn't Peter say Christ? Why didn't he say the Son of God? Why does he very specifically say, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus of Nazareth, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit because he wants us to understand the concept that Jesus, the man, in his human nature, not, jo- not mingled with the divine nature, but joined to the divine nature, was filled with the Spirit of God. Just as Jesus, in his human nature, was chosen to be joined to the divine nature of the Son of God as one person, so also... Jesus, in his human nature, was endowed with the presence of the Holy Spirit resting on him and filling him for ministry. In Isaiah 61, verse 1, you remember the story? Jesus comes out of the wilderness in Luke chapter 4. He goes into a synagogue, and he sits down, he op- or he opens the scriptures. He reads this text, Isaiah 61, and he tells them, it's been fulfilled in your hearing. This is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Notice very clearly here, the Spirit of God given to him is directly related to the ministry he will perform. He Christ brings good news. He binds and heals the brokenhearted. He proclaims liberty to captives. He opens and releases captives from the prison. It's all an exercise of his preaching, teaching, healing ministry. And the Gospels describe the fulfillment of those promises that he would be filled with the Spirit. Mark chapter 1, verse 10. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water. And I always have this picture of him as he's rising up out of the water. And the water is just flowing down his face and his beard and his clothes. And as he does so, the Bible says that the Spirit descended on him like a dove and rested on him so as to fill him. And you know the rest part of the, that verse, the, the Father speaks from heaven, speaks directly to him. I'm convinced he spoke in Aramaic so everybody around could hear and understand. You are my beloved son. In you, my soul and my heart delights. I greatly delight. So Jesus was filled with the Spirit. In Mark 4, verse 1, we see Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. In Luke 4, verse 14, we see that Jesus, after his temptation, returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. In Matthew 12, Jesus actually talks about himself. He says in verse 28, uh, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And it's exactly what was happening. The kingdom of God, if you want a really quick, easy way to understand the kingdom of God, it's Jesus' rule and reign over his people. When we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done, your kingdom come. What we're really saying is may your reign and rule over us increase in our lives. So he's saying to them, if I cast out demons, how am I doing it? By the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And indeed it has in the person of Christ, the servant king. God the Father filled his servant Jesus with his spirit. Now, As you all know from reading the New Testament, there are certain fruits or attributes that are present when the Spirit of God is present. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 11, take your Bibles and stick your finger in 42 and jump back over to Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to read just one verse here, but I want you to see it for yourselves. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. I should just read one and two because they go together so well. <clears throat> he says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. 
and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, and so on. Notice there. He has the spirit of the Lord rests upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So when the spirit of God filled Jesus, there were very clear attributes and fruit present to display the spirit's present in him. There's a spirit of wisdom, which is the capacity for right judgment. And when you see the stories in the Gospels, and that you love those stories, right, where the, the scribes or the Pharisees or the, the leaders of the Jews come and they're going to test Jesus. They're going to trick him and trap him in his words. And we just smile and laugh as you start to read the story because we know what Jesus is going to do. He'll see right through them. His wisdom, the wisdom of God will give him the capacity for the right judgment of those issues and how to answer them. The spirit of understanding. There's ability with the Spirit's filling, to see to the heart of the issue. And Jesus, again and again and again, he sees right through to the heart of the issue. I love the story when they bring the woman taken in adultery, right? And they're all there, and they got the one woman laying on the ground in front of him, and they're all gathering around, and they say, Jesus, the law says that such as her should be stoned. But what do you say, Jesus? And you can almost see them smiling and nudging. What's he going to do now? Here he is preaching love and all this other stuff. And now they throw this woman down in front of him. And Jesus sees right through the issue. He sees what they're up to. I think she should be stoned. Let him that's without sin cast the first stone. And some have argued, I don't know how accurate, I haven't checked it out, but some have argued his words literally mean, he that's without this sin, let him cast the first stone. And all of a sudden, the crowd gets quiet, and the Bible says they all dropped their rocks one by one and walked away, and pretty soon there's nobody but Jesus and the woman left, and he sees right through the issue. There's a spirit of counsel, the discernment for the right course of action. You love the story when Jesus is sitting by the well, and the Samaritan woman is there, and they begin to talk back and forth. And Jesus understands exactly what's going on in her life. He knows her because he is the omniscient God, the all-knowing one. And he says, go call your husband. And immediately you see the walls go up because she knows, uh-oh, he just hit a sore point with me. Well, I don't really have a husband tries to duck out of the issue, and Jesus can see right through what's going on. He has the spirit of wisdom and counsel and so on, and he confronts her and tells her to go and bring her husband. There's a spirit of power he's talked about there. There's a power to see the course of action through to its completion. In Jesus' miracles and signs and wonders, we see the power of God at work to display Jesus Christ as God in knowledge spirit of knowledge. There's an enjoyment of the deep, personal, intimate relationship with God. One of the things I love about the Jesus, as you read the stories, how often do we read that Jesus departed to a lonely place and there he was praying. Jesus, after a long, hard day of ministry in Mark chapter 1, while everybody's still asleep, he's been ministering in the synagogue in the daytime. He's been working with Peter's family in the afternoon. He's been healing all the villagers as the sun went down. And now late at night, he goes to bed. But early, early in the morning, the Bible makes it clear, while everybody is still sawing logs in their beds, Jesus is quietly stepping over all the sleeping bodies and making his way out. And he goes off to a place by himself. And there he prays because there is a deep, intimate knowledge of God that Jesus enjoys. Jesus prayed. Up on a mountaintop, his disciples are struggling. There's doubt, there's unbelief. They're out on the ocean or the, the lake by themselves. And he's up on the mountaintop praying for them. He's enjoying that spirit of knowledge, that deep, intimate relationship between him and his father and that knowledge of God that demands and prompts in all of us the fear of the Lord, which leads to obedience 
and the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, obeyed his Father in everything, everything he did. His conduct was fitting. It befitted what it meant to be the Lord's servant. His conduct displayed his loyalty to the Lord. His conduct displayed worship of God. He obeyed and he trusted God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 and, or 3, I think it is, that when he was being crucified, he entrusted himself to the one who was able to judge justly. He displayed the presence of the Spirit of God in his life all through his ministry. But you know, brothers and sisters, just as the spirit-filled servant of the Lord had all those things, we ourselves, who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, who have trusted in him for salvation, we also are filled with the spirit of God. And you know, when we look and see how should we do ministry, how should we study and, and preach, how should we exercise pastoral ministry, how should the deacons do the deacon. How should the elders do the eldering? How should the preachers do the preaching? And we have all kinds of books. And I was actually surprised. I sat back and I thought to myself, how many books in my library, and I got a decent sized library, actually talk about ministry purely from this perspective of considering and studying Jesus? And I have a shelf, no joke, it's this long, two of them, that have books on ministry, preaching, shepherding, all that stuff. Do you know how many books I have on Jesus' ministry? One. You know why? It's the only one I've ever found. In fact, I, it wasn't even found. June Lyle, <laughs> God bless June Lyle, she gave it to me. One book, a little thin one. And yet the greatest example for how we are to do ministry as spirit-filled men and women is Jesus himself. Why is it we look to others so quickly for answers and illustration? An example, I love Charles Spurgeon. I love uh, John Bunyan. I love Charles Simeon, these great old men of the faith who faithfully ministered the word of God in their context. But you know what? They're failing flawed examples. And the Gospels give us the vast bulk of the Gospel stories are Jesus in ministry. We look and we observe and we study the spirit-filled ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is glorious and wonderful in his spirit-filled ministry. And that ministry is to be exercised by us. Jesus began his ministry of taking the truth to the nations. But he has left us with the responsibility of finishing that ministry, of carrying it on. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth, which brings us to Australia, right? This is the remotest parts of the earth when you think about where Israel is. Paul prayed. For the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. And he gave us a model for how we ought to pray for one another. He prayed that the God of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So how do we minister? We minister in the power of the Spirit of God. We minister by looking to and seeing the example of Jesus who had the Spirit of God placed on him for his ministry. I mentioned this several times in my time at Noble Park, but you know what? It bears repeating. We ought, we must pray for each other for the ever-increasing influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus of Nazareth was a man just like us, tempted in every way just like us, and yet without sin. And he lived and existed and did his ministry in the power of the Spirit of God. You and I, sinful yet saved, saved by the grace of God, called to minister and witness and work to build up the kingdom of God, to spread the gospel, are to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ought to be praying for each other as the days go by. Lord, increase 
the influence of the Spirit of God in my brothers' and sisters' lives as they reach out with the gospel, as they live and work as moms, as teachers, as doctors, as lawyers, as carpenters, as plumbers, as engineers, wherever they are that the Spirit of God will influence them in their ministry and use them for ministry. Jesus promised us in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13 that to those who ask him, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Spirit to us? Paul commanded us to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5.18. How are we going to receive the action of being filled? We ask for it. We cry out to God for it. And the promise of Scripture is that we will receive it. Now, we're commanded to be filled. I absolutely affirm that there is one and one only baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. This whole idea that you may have heard about, multiple fillings, second baptism, all of that, it's not in Scripture. The Spirit of God fills you and seals you and stamps you as belonging to Christ the moment you are saved. The Spirit never leaves you. That's the mark. That's how we know that we are believers because of the presence of the Spirit of God in us. But because of sin, that influence can be so often hindered. So we cry out to God to increase the influence of the Spirit of God in each of ours and each other's lives, and we strive to put off the things that hinder His influence. We strive to live and practice Spirit-filled lives and ministry, and we do it first and foremost by seeing Jesus. The command again in Isaiah 42.1, Behold, look. Somebody uh, summarized the sermon last week to his father-in-law and said, the whole sermon can be summed up in one word. Look, behold. And that's true in a way. That's the command to us, to look and see. But in looking and seeing, we will be changed into the same image of Christ as we see and behold. So the power for his ministry was the Holy Spirit. The purpose for his ministry is to bring forth justice And I would say that that word most likely means truth. Verse 1, you notice what he says. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. In verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. And in verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the word for justice in the Hebrew is the word mispat. It means decision or law or judgment. It has a sense of truth, God's truth. Um, for example, a judge bringing a verdict or a judgment over a case. You know, he's, they, they sit up on the bench and they say that very deep, solemn voice, Mr. So-and-so on the night of January the 14th did willfully and deliberately and with malice aforethought steal the contents of his wife's handbag or something like that. And they make that pronouncement. They're making a verdict. They're rendering a judgment. What does that mean? What it means is they are setting forth and stating the truth of a set of circumstances. So so so-and-so stole something from so-and-so. So-and-so plotted to murder so-and-so. They are stating the truth of what happened in that circumstances. So when the Bible says that Jesus brings forth justice to the nations or judgment to the nations, the idea behind that word is all of the truth of God as God sees, which is, makes it absolutely true, on the whole situation. So the statement, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that's a statement of truth about all of creation. It's God's statement of what the real circumstances are. Mankind says, oh, I'm not a sinner. I just, my mother never hugged me enough. Oh, I'm not a sinner. I I just have fell on bad times and I had, I was forced by my circumstances to do X. Well, you know, I didn't really commit adultery. I just fell in love with this other woman. And so mankind, in their perspective, puts all sorts of spins and they portray something that is not true. 
For when God sets forth the truth of something, it is absolutely true. So Jesus came. He came speaking truth. He came announcing and declaring God's truth to God's people. My favorite commentator, a Puritan fellow by the name of Matthew Henry said, he described it as God's infinite wisdom, holiness, and equity to set up a religion in the world. In other words, Jesus came to set forth, to bring forth justice to the nations, setting forth truth to the nations, and calling the nations to worship and fear and serve and love and trust Almighty God. Keelan DeLitch, two uh, German commentators, describe it as justice or true religion. That's what that word means. Alec Motyer, who is a great Old Testament scholar, wrote a great big long commentary in the book of Isaiah. He says, justice he would bring is divine truth. So in Isaiah 49 and verse 6, Isaiah writing again of the servant of the Lord says, It's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Christ, the servant of the Lord, will bring forth the truth of God, the light of God to the nations. What do we see? In John chapter 1 and verse 4, Jesus came into the world full of grace and truth. Yeah. In John 1, 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John verse, chapter 8 and verse 40, Jesus has told them and us the truth that he heard and received from God. So when Isaiah writes, he says, I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He's saying, I have filled him with my spirit, and he will bring forth the truth of God and declare it to the nations. Hebrews chapter 1, right? God in time past and in diverse manner spake unto the forefathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us in son. There's, there's no uh, article there, I think, no, no pronoun. In Son. In other words, the Son was the full expression of God's truth to God's creation, God's people. Jesus told them the truth that he heard. In Mark 1, verses 37 to 39, even though everyone was looking for Jesus to have him heal their sicknesses, he went to other towns nearby, and the reason he gave his disciples was that he may preach there also, for that is why he came. He came primarily to preach the truth, to bring forth justice, to bring forth the truth to the nations. And you say, what does that truth include? The truth of God that Jesus brought included God's holiness and man's sinfulness. Jesus' explanation, declaration of the truth included God's coming judgment and wrath and man's doom underneath it. He preached God's saving abundance of love to send Christ to save. He preached God's grace in saving the lost. He preached faith and repentance. The first words that we have in our New Testament are Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 of Jesus' ministry. And he came and said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Those are the first words he preached as he came in ministry as an adult. Christ not only proclaimed that truth, and this is the part that is so wonderful about our Savior. He not only proclaimed the truth, he lived and ministered, he suffered and died to display and effect its reality. He was the one who preached the truth and he is the one who died as Wes was describing that he might effect the reality of our salvation for us through his own death. Brothers and sisters, listen, look Behold, see, study the glory of the Lord's servant as he obediently and faithfully and unwaveringly brought forth, brought forth the justice and truth of God. See Jesus. 
just close your eyes and, and think about these scenes as I lay them out for you. See Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. But what's he doing? He's seated in the center of the teachers of the law. He's teaching them the law of God through questions and answers. See Jesus setting forth the justice of God even as a young child. See Jesus seated up on the mountaintop. And he calls his disciples and they come to him. And when they sit down around him and the crowd's out a little further away, he begins to teach his disciples and he gives them the Sermon on the Mount. Isn't it remarkable that Jesus lived for 33 years? 30 years. 90% of Jesus' life is virtually silent and unknown. 10% of his life. And of that 10%, almost all of it is ministry in one form or another. He was healing and so on, but he was also teaching and preaching. Look through the Gospels. Read all the long accounts as Jesus is speaking. His goal, his whole life was given over to bringing forth God's truth to the nations. See, Jesus as he stands beside the Sea of Galilee and he's preaching the gospel. See Jesus, he's out in the boat with Peter, teaching the crowds on shore. And then he turns to Peter and he ministers to him face to face. He brings the truth of God to the point where Peter falls on his knees in the bottom of the boat and says, depart from me, for I am an ungodly man. See Jesus standing in the pulpit inside the at the, uh, starting at the pulpit, inside the synagogues, reading the scriptures and then sitting down and every eye is focused on Jesus and he begins to explain to them that these scriptures have been fulfilled in him. He's ministering the truth of God to the people of God. See Jesus late at night in a quiet one-on-one -on -one with Nicodemus, teaching him the truth that he and we all must be born again. Everywhere he goes, Jesus' priority is bringing the truth of God to the people of God that God might be glorified. See Jesus, weary from his journey, stopping in the heat of the noonday sun to talk to a lonely, sinful Samaritan woman at the well, teaching her about himself as the living water, which when we drink of him, we will never thirst again. See Jesus. In your mind's eyes, see him walking through the temple courts, teaching the crowds and pausing to deal with an angry mob, determined to use a woman taken in adultery to trap him with his words. But then we see Jesus in grace and mercy, setting her free from their clutches. Wonderful truth. Let him without sin cast the first stone. They left a pile all around her for him to pick up and throw at her. He was the only one that had the right with those words. And he set her free. Go and sin no more. Knowing, knowing with a reality that he would take her sin upon himself in a very short time. See Jesus in John 7, 37 and 38, standing up on the last day of the feast and crying out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And the one that gets me the most. See Jesus hanging on a cross. And one thief, both thieves initially began to heap abuses and curse at him. You may not know this, you may do, but in case you don't, in order to speak as they were being crucified, they had to push down the nails in their hands and feet and push themselves up to relieve the tension on their chest to be able to push the air out and speak. And these two men hanging on the cross, one on each side of Jesus, are so infuriated and so wound up by the crowd, they're dying. They're dying. They're going to be dead in hours. Every breath is costing them a terrible amount of pain in order to speak. And yet they take the time and the energy to push down on the nails and curse Jesus across the way. But one. One after a little period of time. Perhaps it was Jesus' words to his mother and John. Perhaps it was Jesus and the way he did not respond to the crowds. 
Perhaps it was he knew Jesus beyond that scene on the cross. But whatever it was, something affected that man on the cross. And he saw Jesus and he recognized in this one there was nothing wrong. And one turns to his friend and says, do you not even fear God? We are suffering justly for our crimes, but this one has done nothing wrong. And he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, at the worst point, the lowest point beyond anything you and I can understand or imagine, he pushes down the nails in his hands and feet and he pushes up against the cross and turns to the man and says, today you will be with me in paradise. And he takes time, even there. He's about to go into the worst suffering any human could possibly endure. And he could only endure it because the spirit of God was in him and he is human nature and divine nature joined together. He had to go into enduring the full weight of, of God's wrath against us, and yet even in that moment, he pauses to speak words of truth and grace to the other thief on the cross. See Jesus turning to speak the cross across the man to assure him of salvation. You want to know what ministry is all about? You want to know what it, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor, or an elder, or a deacon, or not. We're all in ministry. Brothers and sisters, never ever get the idea in your head that ministry is reduced to a small group of men in leadership in a church. It's not. It's all of us. Pastors are given as a gift to the church to build up and equip the saints, everybody in the church, for the work of ministry. We want to know what ministry is all about. Look to and look at and contemplate Jesus Christ. See him. Follow his example. He ministered when he was weary and tired. He ministered when it was inconvenient. He ministered despite overwhelming, cruel, and cutting opposition. He ministered in full submission to his father. You know what? I think the reason why I have one simple small book in my library about the ministry example of Christ is I think we write off We say, oh, well, you know, he was the son of God. He is the son of God. We could never minister the way that he did. Yes, absolutely. Praise God. He is truly God. But brother and sister, never lose sight of the other side of it, that he is also truly man. He, like us as believers in him, he was filled in his humanity with the Holy Spirit for the purpose of ministry, just like you and I. Following Jesus does not start and finishing, finish with trusting in Christ for salvation, then learning ministry from everywhere and everybody else. Following Jesus means striving, striving to live, to speak, to minister, to be like Jesus in every aspect of his life. He called us, brothers and sisters. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Come after me. Come live the way I lived. Jesus did not buy into the modern gospel the modern idea of Christianity, which is all about getting all of what you want from God, like a giant candy slot machine in the sky, that if you put in enough faith and enough repentance, you can get the things that you want, that you can have all the riches and wealth of this world. No, the call to follow Christ is a radical call to discipleship, to saying no to self and yes to Christ. I just finished reading. If anybody wants a fantastic book to read, you need a dictionary to get through it. It's by a guy named Stephen Sharnock, who was an old Puritan fellow, and he wrote a book called Christ Crucified. He talks about the wonderful balance between the voluntariness, the willingness of Christ to be, to be crucified, to suffer and die for the sake of his people, and the necessity of it, and how the necessity of it 
never once undermined or challenged or robbed from Christ's willingness to suffer and die for his people. And brothers and sisters in Christ, what our world is looking for is to see followers of Christ who live like Jesus, who minister like Jesus. And I hate to break it to us all, and I mean us all, but ministry is not when it's convenient, not when we have time, not on our terms. He is Lord. Lord of all or not Lord at all. Jesus doesn't take us on a sliding scale of commitment. He says, you abandon all else and come follow me. The whole idea of coming and following Jesus and picking up that cross is a letting go of everything that we hold dear to say, I will follow Jesus no matter what. Look at the example of the Son of God. Didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. Didn't hang on to his deity for fear of losing it. Didn't hold on to the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. He was willing to give it up, to lay it aside for a time that he might come and serve. And brothers and sisters, he's calling us to the same. See, I could never do that. Where would I gain the strength to do something like that? And my answer is, See Jesus. Because the wonderful thing is you you don't have the strength to do it. But in seeing Christ and looking and long and, and, and gazing on him, seeing the beauty of who he is in all of his life and ministry, that's how we are changed into the image of Christ. That's how we can pick up our cross and follow him. Notice verse 1, he says, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Yet isn't it interesting? That was a promise made about the servant of the Lord. Yet his limited ministry was with only a few rare exceptions. It was to the Jews and Israel only. Yet the promise was you will bring forth justice to the nations. Nations, plural. God said in Isaiah 49, 6, it's too light a thing. It's too small. It's too easy for you to merely gather the tribes of Jacob back together and give them the gospel. I will make you give give the gospel to all the nations. Jesus began the work of bringing God's truth to the nations, and he has entrusted us with completing it. Jesus' words in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth, which in his time meant somewhere like Rome. And the gospel, the story of the New Testament completes as the gospel is established in Rome and it's still going on. The apostles were given the great task of delivering the gospel to Jerusalem and Judea and so on. In Acts eleven eighteen, we see the grace of God that he has granted repentance to the Gentiles. It's his gift. And you and I as Gentile peoples have received the grace of God and come to faith and repentance in Christ. We've been called to follow Christ and to finish the ministry that he began. How are we going to do that? By preaching Christ who is the truth of God. By preaching the whole counsel of God to the nations, our gospel message must not and it will not be watered down to make it more palatable under any circumstances. So long as I can draw a breath and stand in a pulpit, I won't do it. I will preach the gospel in its fullness. And brothers and sisters in Christ, that is what God calls us to do. We will minister and preach the holiness of God and the wickedness of sin. We will minister and preach the truth of God's wrath against unrepentant sinners, and we'll preach God's grace to those who repent and believe. We'll preach God's love for the world and his own people. We'll we'll preach repentance of sin and faith in God, and we'll preach the call to trust and obey. That's how we're going to do it. 
Why? Because we got the strength in us? Absolutely not. We'll do it because his spirit has been given to us. And the giving of the spirit to the servant was that so that he might bring forth justice to the nations. In Acts 8, 1 and verse 8, the giving of the spirit to the disciples was why? So they could be his witnesses. It's as simple as that. Brother and sister in Christ, what do we do with all this? Here's me banging away for 48 minutes and 16 seconds now. Yeah, I do keep track. What are we going to do with it all? Well, here's my call to us. Look to Christ. First and foremost, above all else, before any ministry comes, we begin by looking and studying Christ in the Gospels and all through the Scriptures. We plead with God. And I mean plead like a beggar who is on his last little bit and desperately needs a plea with God in prayer for the increased influence of the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives so that we might minister to others. This whole idea that we get the Spirit of God to display these great gifts and show everybody how spiritual we are, it's not in Scripture. The purpose of the giving of the Spirit of God is that we might minister to others, to come alongside brothers and sisters who are hurting and struggling and put our arm around their shoulders and minister what? Some little self-help tidbit? No. We minister the Word of God. We bring the healing power of God's Word to bear in each other's lives. We strive to put off the old man and put on Christ. And we look with an unveiled face to see the glory of Christ, to be transformed by what you see into his image, to the glory of his name. Brother and sister in Christ, you have the word of God in your hands and the spirit of God filling you. What will you do? What will I do? My hope and my prayer for every one of us as we work our way through the scriptures, preaching and teaching and praying and studying and sharing with one another is that we will all be changed to look more like Jesus. Let's pray. Loving Father, again, we come before you and we just bow in worship before the Son of God. Father, as we see him there on a cross, worst point in all of existence, of all of history, past, present, and future, when the Son of God who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, to bear the awful, unimaginable weight of your wrath that was due to us, that he might save us, And yet, Father, in those moments, he still took time to turn and minister truth to a dying soul. Father, we thank you and we praise you for our Savior. Father, we confess together before you our easiness to minister when it's easy and when it's convenient. When we have time. But, Father, I pray. I plead with you, O God, that you would do a work in every one of our lives, that we would minister as Jesus ministered, ministering in the power of the Spirit of God, ministering through unceasing prayer, ministering in fellowship with you. Father, help us, we pray. We plead with you, O God, that you would do a great work in every single one of our hearts. Father, for those who don't know Christ, the message is the same. Turn and see Jesus. Father, we ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to do a work in this place. We plead for it in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.